GIS and geo visualization for the humanities and social sciences. She's a founding member of the Interdisciplinary Holocaust Geographies Collaborative. In addition to major grants from the National Science Foundation and National Endowment for the Humanities, her pioneering research has been recognized by a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship and the first annual American Ingenuity Award for Historical Scholarship from Smithsonian Magazine in 2012. Since coming to the University of Maine in 2015, Professor Knowles has attracted growing numbers of graduate students in the, his, in the history and interdisciplinary PhD programs. Her courses include Power of Maps, Historical Geography, Digital and Spatial History, American Landscapes, and the Holocaust. Professor Knowles will be speaking tonight about the idea of place in the Holocaust. People tend to think of the Holocaust as being represented by a few famous places such as Auschwitz or Treblinka. This talk will open up the idea of Holocaust places by showing how many kinds of places, large and small, were involved in the genocide and how thinking about the places where the Holocaust happened can help us to understand victims' experiences. So welcome Professor Knowles and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Erica and Tam. Uh, I am really pleased to be here this year for the first time. Uh, I am beginning to connect with the communities in Maine who care about the Holocaust. I gave a talk at the Bangor Public Library about uh, six weeks ago, I think. Um, now uh, meeting all of you virtually, but virtually is pretty good. Um, uh, I take this kind of connection very seriously and I welcome it. Um, I came here in 2015, as Erica mentioned. Before that, I'd taught at liberal arts colleges. I began my career teaching overseas in Wales, where I taught historical geography in Welsh. That's a whole other story. If you're curious, I can tell you about it. I mentioned that because I came to the subject of the Holocaust kind of midway through my career. It was in 2005, 2006, that I began to think about studying the Holocaust after spending many, many years studying American immigration and industrialization in the 19th century. I was what they call an Americanist. I'd never had a Holocaust course. I'd never studied the Holocaust in any way. But I got a fateful telephone call from the Holocaust Museum Someone at the other end of the line said, we've heard that you use this thing called GIS, Geographic Information Systems, to map history. And we're thinking maybe it could be useful to map the Holocaust. And I, I kid you not, I felt a bolt of lightning go down my spine and thought, oh my gosh, the Holocaust is so huge. It involved so many places and we know so many millions of people a, com a computational approach ought to be really, really helpful in studying the Holocaust in its complexity, in its vastness. And that phone call began a series of conversations that two years later led to my taking part in a two-week intensive seminar at the Holocaust Museum with colleagues in history and geography and other fields who wanted to do as I did, begin to study the Holocaust as a geographical phenomenon. And it changed my life. It certainly changed my career, but I feel it changed my life as well because uh, even though US immigration history and the history of industry are crucial for understanding how this country developed, I have never felt as committed as I do to studying the Holocaust. There's a uh, significance that just keeps rolling through time in that cluster of events that we call the Holocaust. So I am grateful for so many reasons to be with you today. Um, and with that uh, bit of an introduction, I will launch my slides. And as the first one sort of sinks in, um, I want to mention I've added this subtitle now. This is another recasting of what Erica mentioned. I've come to believe that it actually is quite unfortunate 
that for most people who are not Holocaust scholars, certainly, Auschwitz has come to stand for the Holocaust. It's in so many films, including Schindler's List, the most watched Holocaust film in history. Um, and Auschwitz actually was the great exception. There was no other place like it because it combined a concentration camp, a labor camp, a transit camp. It was enormous, the biggest of them all. Um, it had, uh, the, of course, the gas chambers and the crematoria. It was a death camp. It, it sort of combined all of the uh, huge aspects of the Holocaust in one place. So, of course, it's important. But the Holocaust, as it happened to individuals and families and communities across Europe, was, for most people, not like what happened in Auschwitz. And so that's why I've added this subtitle, an argument for why Auschwitz should not stand for the Holocaust. I'm not sure what should, but I don't think Auschwitz should. Now I'd like to step out for just a moment and I'd like to read you a poem by one of my favorite poets, Czesław Miłosz. Uh, I will return to that poem. I just want to show you little Czesław with his mama in 1913. He was born into a wealthy family on an estate on the Issa River, which is behind the superimposed image, um, in the center of Lithuania. And here I am standing with my hero in 2017. This poem strikes me as an excellent way to begin to shift the way we think about places in the Holocaust, away from the big and famous places, and also to begin thinking about why should we care about places where genocide happens, whether it's the historical genocide of the Holocaust or present day genocide. The poem is called A Song on the End of the World. On the day the world ends, a bee circles a clover. A fisherman mends a glimmering net. Happy porpoises jump in the sea. By the rain spout, young sparrows are playing, and the snake is gold-skinned as it should always be. I've left out this stanza, just for space. On the day the world ends, women walk through the fields under their umbrellas. A drunkard grows sleepy at the edge of a lawn. Vegetable peddlers shout in the street and a yellow-sailed boat comes nearer the island. The voice of a violin lasts in the air and leads into a starry night. And those who expected lightning and thunder are disappointed. And those who expected signs and archangels' trumps do not believe it is happening now. As long as the sun and the moon are above, as long as the bumblebee visits a rose, as long as rosy infants are born, no one believes it is happening now. Only a white-haired old man, who would be a prophet, yet is not a prophet, for he's much too busy, repeats while he binds his tomatoes, no other end of the world will there be. No other end of the world will there be. Czesław Miłosz wrote this poem as a young man in Warsaw in 1944. He had grown up in the countryside, went to a series of European capitals to attain the finest uh, education. He was First, a uh, native Polish speaker, but also spoke Lithuanian, German, Russian, and many other languages. He went to spend much of his career in the United States at UC Berkeley. That's how I became familiar with his poetry. This is what he saw in Warsaw. This is one of the rare photos taken during the German bombardment um, as the Soviets in 1944 were watching from the east, they let the Germans destroy Warsaw. 
This is from the very center of Warsaw, and I think you'll see the shape of the building that barely remains standing in my next photograph from 2018. This is rebuilt central Old Town Warsaw. One of the kinds of, I don't know, call it a miracle or a very interesting cultural decision by the Soviets once they had control of Poland was that they would not destroy Warsaw. They would fund its reconstruction as a sign of goodwill to the Polish people. And so a wonderful preservationist was brought in, all sorts of skilled artisans. On the right is a mural, a sort of self-portrait by some of the people who were hired in the late 1940s, early 1950s to do the complete restoration of the Baroque town center. And on the left is one of the many buildings that was rebuilt, redecorated with all, using all the old crafts of stone carving and mural painting and everything else to bring the center of this Polish capital back to its full glory. Warsaw was, of course, also the site of the largest Jewish ghetto during World War II, which at its peak held something like 435,000 Jews. Warsaw had the largest, the single largest urban Jewish population before World War II of anywhere in the world. It was a center of culture, of religious and secular Jewish life. Uh, Jews were part of Polish society at every level, disproportionately represented, however, in the Polish intelligentsia. They had fought in World War I. They were deeply integrated throughout the society, as they were in Germany. Urban Jews, like so many of the Jews in Poland, were Polish first and Jewish second for many. But what is left of the Polish ghetto? where Jews mounted, not, not only endured incredible suffering, but they also mounted the biggest resistance to the Germans of any Jewish ghetto community um, in 1943. Well, there's this memorial, which I think is beautifully designed with a little map of the largest extent of the Jewish ghetto. It was near the very center of the city, though it didn't include the old town that I just showed you. Um, this is very handsome. But it's only, I'm looking in the photo on the right, that's at eye level for me and I'm five foot two. So the whole scale of this little memorial is petite compared with the massive, effectively memorial reconstruction of Old Town Central Warsaw, which is about a 10 minute walk from here. What else is memorialized about the ghetto? It again is, I think, very attractive and, and appropriate and interesting that the ghetto walls have been marked out in the ground with a combination of uh, brick and metal. The lettering here is in metal embedded in concrete, so it will last a long time. Ghetto established 1940, um, the extent of the ghetto wall in 1943 is what they've marked out. That's significant because the ghetto walls changed many, many times. Um, but anyway, they've chosen a particular extent to show on the ground. And you can try to follow that. But in fact, this memorial to the place that was the ghetto, flat to the ground, does not completely outline the ghetto. I spent most of a day trying to trace the outline of the ghetto in this way. And this only continues a couple hundred yards. So even this memorial to the ghetto is very incomplete as a presence in the landscape. If you know where to look, you can see other remnants of the ghetto. This uh, tram line, which heads now into a park, a beautiful city park that was um, created after the, or refurbished and improved after the war. Um, you look one way, it goes into the park. I turn around and take a picture the other way and it goes into the ghetto. What was the ghetto? There had been big ghetto gates here. But unless you know that, there's no sign to tell you. So one of the first ideas I would like to introduce is that many very important places in the Holocaust 
where scores, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people were as victims of the Holocaust are scarcely marked in the landscape. What we know best, at least in the West and particularly the United States is, despite what I've just said, the Holocaust as it unfolded in Poland. And this map begins to explain why. So here I'm introducing another idea that the Holocaust that we know best has been shaped by who survived, not necessarily where it happened or to whom. This map was made by a good friend of mine and a wonderful cartographer named Eric Steiner, who, when he made this, was the creative director of the Stanford University Spatial History Lab. And he and I were working with some data that we received from the Shoah Foundation. The Shoah Foundation was established uh, largely out of the profits from Schindler's List. Um, by Steven Spielberg, a fantastic project that he launched in the 1990s to try to preserve the memories of the Holocaust, largely through interviewing survivors. So this map shows where people who gave interviews to the Shoah Foundation had been born. And what it really picks out, I think what jumps off the map to my eyes, are the two Polish cities, Łódź which was the second largest city in Poland at the time, and Warsaw. And then Budapest, Hungary, the capital of Hungary, which had the, um, the second, I think the second or third largest Polish population, I beg your pardon, Jewish population before the war, um, several hundred thousand. Then in Vienna, which also had a very sizable Jewish population, and Berlin. Now in Berlin, there were far fewer Jews, but more of them proportionately survived. So these five cities have an oversized presence in the spoken record, the spoken memories, recorded memories of the Holocaust, not just at the, Holocaust, at, uh, the Shoah Foundation, but also at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, and in Polish and German and Austrian archives and so on. The regions to the West, um, excuse me, the regions to the east, um, where most ghettos were, as you'll see in a map in just a moment, are far, far less well represented. So a couple of quick maps. Much of the work that I do in studying the Holocaust as a geographer is to collect information from historical sources and then map it. I feel I can't begin to understand history until I can see it on a map. So this map and the next one are particularly helpful for the, the basic sort of uh, scale, magnitude of the Holocaust. This one represents SS administered concentration and labor camps. And I'll have a, another map in a moment that distinguishes between those two. And there are little tiny red dots here. They'll be bigger on another map that show where the extermination camps were. So just hold, sort of squint your eyes a little and hold that geographic pattern in your memory while I show you where the ghettos were. Very different distribution. The SS camps are all the way through the Reich, basically, German-occupied territory under Reich control out of Berlin. Most of the ghettos were east of that. And here we begin to get a sense of how many places, how many Jewish communities there were in Eastern Europe and in Central Europe. Hungary is represented strongly here as well, but this is largely people who were born in the countryside and then migrated to Budapest. I've become particularly interested in what is now Ukraine, but included in the area where my cursor is now, Eastern Galicia and Lithuania. You see how very few dots there are for ghettos in Lithuania. There were actually more ghettos than that we've realized since we made this map. And they do not represent the 90,000 Jews who were living there. It looks like far fewer than that because the, there are so few dots. Here's the map that I was saying was going to come of 
concentration and labor camps. So in our um, sort of general or popular knowledge of the Holocaust, concentration camps loom large. These are the KLs, the Konzentrationslager, um, like <laughs> Auschwitz, I've got to say it again, but there were 23 altogether that were under SS administration, including all the way up into uh, the far northern Baltics and in Riga in Latvia, in Kovno or in German Cowan, uh, Lithuania, and so on. They were concentrated, however, within the Reich proper. The little dots in the same color are the sub camps or labor camps that were associated with each concentration camp. So, for example, in uh, Austria or annexed Austria, Mauthausen with its sort of satellite camps um, located relatively nearby. I've included one of, one of the things I do um, besides making maps is once you've collected data uh, on any phenomenon, you can represent it in many ways. So the information I just showed you in map form is here shown in a tabular form. I think of this like a computer punch card. And what this visual is picking out is when camps were established. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is the difference between the black jots. Each one is the establishment of a new concentration camp, uh, a laga. And then the little red camps, not these early camps, but all the ones beyond this middle line, are labor or satellite camps. So Himmler is staking out his empire between um, first establishing Dachau as a model and sort of working out punishment regimes there. Next is Sachsenhausen and Buchenwald, uh, um, Bossenburg, and then things begin to pick up pace. Then Auschwitz comes along, uh, established as a concentration camp and a destination for labor near the end of 1940, up here on the second row. But then the rest here, is when things really shift, when it's no longer the Germans punishing, confining, or torturing or murdering their political opponents, but it's about the massive use and the massive extermination of large numbers of people, Jews, gypsies, Catholics, as well as political opponents, homosexuals, and many, many more. And I'd like to draw your eye to the concentration of red lines in late 1944, early 45, which is when the Germans are frantic for labor, male and female, anyone who can do work is being shunted into production either of arms, rockets, munitions, or food, farming, uh, clothing, uh, cleaning up the streets, debt defusing bombs, just putting forced labor to any kind of work possible. This is one of the basic uh, this was a revelation for me to see how different, even within the concentration camp system, uh, how different the tempo, the, con the intensity of the use of labor was over time. But to come back to place, this is yet again a different view of the camps and the ghettos data. So since about 2008, I've been building data sets for mapping. First, the SS camp system, then in over the last five or six years, ghettos in German occupied Eastern Europe. And I would like to acknowledge here our research partners at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, who provided the initial data that we've then developed, tried to precisely map and so on. And I think this map makes a more powerful impression than those little teeny dots of just how many ghettos there were in Eastern Europe. The gray area here is the full extent of uh, territory occupied by the Germans uh, up to their maximal extent. Um, and then of course, they're pushed back by the Russians yeah, beginning in 1943. And here the red stars of the extermination camps are more visible. They are of course, extremely important. But I'd like to move now to introduce you to another way I've been thinking about place that I think is quite new. One of the things that we've been uh, recording about ghettos is what kinds of places they were. Um, how did they actually confine Jews? 
How many of them, for example, had a wall? Walled ghettos like Warsaw are the most famous. They're certainly the only kind that I've seen films made about. But when we map, this is from the Holocaust Museum's encyclopedia, which is quite exhaustive, uh, gives us a huge amount of information. When we map ghettos with a wall, there are only 21. And almost all of them are in Poland. By the way, these little regions with the three letter abbreviations are the German administrative regions. That's our sort of base map for this period. But if you look, we look at ghettos enclosed with barbed wire, they're far, far more frequent. And that was another mental shift for me. People enclosed by barbed wire are being enclosed briefly. It's a kind of confinement done in haste. It's material that can just be hauled in on the back of a truck, as opposed to building a wall, which takes much more labor, much more time, much more effort. Often somebody would design it. Barbed wire, you just throw around some wooden or metal posts and you're done. It also has a particular kind of brutality about it. People confined by barbed wire might also be more visible to bystanders, feel more exposed, more vulnerable. So this, this aspect of our work, looking at the material landscapes of ghettoization, I feel are bringing us a little bit closer to the lived experience of people in these places. Then I said I'm really interested in Lithuania. Um, up there, there were many ghetto enclosures with barbed wire, but there also was a disproportionate use of existing buildings. This could be abandoned factories, a brickyard, uh, a barn, um, any sort of a school. The opportunistic use of structures for very brief confinement was particularly common in the Baltics. And I, I haven't included one of the visuals that really drives this home, but I'll try to describe it to you. In Poland, particularly Western Poland, around Warsaw and the Wartegau and so forth, Radom, ghettos, ghettos tended to exist for somewhere between a year and a half and two years, some even longer. The Wodz ghetto was open for three years or more. In Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, the duration of ghettos on average was about 90 days, and many of them existed for a week, or in a few cases, even just a few hours. In such places, the opportunistic use of an existing building, clear out the school kids, put it off limits, put the Jews in there, and take them out to be shot the next day. That makes the traces left in places where that happened so light so difficult to hold on for memorialization, that's another way that places carry or lose the memories of what happened in them where the destruction was so swift. Now I'd like to take you to one particular place that I'm trying to get to know well. Uh, it's called Buchach. It's in present day Western Ukraine. At the time of World War II, it was in a region still called Eastern Galicia. It had had one empire after another, claim it, use it. Uh, it's not particularly good farmland, but it was good enough that there were estates here going back to the 17th century and so on. It was one of the places where Jews were invited in by the local landlord in the 16th and 17th century to take care of their farming estates for them. Um, and so the population of Buchach, uh, when the Germans arrived in late 1941, was about half Jewish, about 8,000 Jews in a town of about 15 and a half thousand people. This is what it looked like approximately. Um, I'm afraid I have not been to Buchach and because of the war in Ukraine, I'm not sure when I will be able to get there, um, which is not the reason I'm brokenhearted about what's happening there but um, the pictures I'm showing you are, are instead of my going. This photograph from sometime around the turn of the 20th century uh, has some of the layers of history of this place, some fairly modern buildings, at least probably 50, no more than 100 years old, 
but also along the riverbank, some vernacular housing um, where we know that Jews lived that may have been a sort of wattle and daub with plaster on the outside and um, reed roofs a style of architecture that in this part of Ukraine goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, in this place, I wanted to show you this photograph because it gives such a good idea of the depth of this little valley that the Skripa River winds through in a big S curve. Over on the far right-hand side is a very large building. That's the Bazillion Monastery, which was the dominant presence of Polish Catholicism evident in the landscape, um, just as Czesław Miłosz, the poet, was a Polish-speaking aristocrat, uh, the people in charge of this town were Polish Catholic aristocrats. I also wanted you to see this landscape because it has to do with the sad, sad story that happened here. Buczacz was a place that was occupied for about a year and a half um, before the mass murders really began. This is part of what's called the Holocaust by bullets. Here's an overhead view, a, a miraculous photograph actually, from a Luftwaffe plane in 1944 that picks out both the town that I just showed you, the winding Stripa River, and the places that I've circled begin in blue with that monastery over in the yellow, the mainly Jewish occupied area that was condensed into one tiny neighborhood as a ghetto, but only in 1943, and circled in red, the two mass killing sites. So in this town, Jews were living in the town under German occupation for a year to a year and a half before the knock came on their door and they were taken out and marched hundreds at a time in several of these events thousands of them at a time through the streets, across the bridge and past the monastery. Here's an historical photograph that has been uh, crucial in my trying to understand this intimate landscape. Here's the monastery from one angle. And I've been working with a wonderful group of students in architecture at the University of Padua in Italy, who are learning how to render buildings with digital programs by using Buchach as an example. So here is the monastery as viewed from the street by people, approximately 6,000 Jews at several different times, walked past this building before going around the backside of the hill where they were shot. So in a sense, this is the last thing they saw going past. And these walls over the river valley would have echoed with the sounds of the shooting. So I think these sorts of material details are important to know because it argues everyone in town knew what was happening. Everyone in town saw what was happening. So the trauma of the Holocaust in Bucha was not just for the Jews living there, but for everyone who lived there, probably even the people who facilitated their murder. Now I'd like to shift gears one more time and look at place from a much, in a sense, a much more positive view, the view of resistance, the view of someone courageously recording Jewish life under occupation, going back to Poland, back to Łódź, the Łódź or Lodz ghetto, and the photographer Henrik Ross, who is crouching behind his camera here. He ran a photo studio in Łódź before the Germans came. He took wedding photos, he took bar mitzvah photos, uh, you know, people's birthdays, all sorts of nice things. Um, and during German occupation, he and his wife became undercover spies to record Jewish life and keep it safe for the future. So all the photos now I'm going to show you are from, from a wonderful photo exhibition that I saw a number of years ago. It began at the Art Gallery of Ontario, which published this book of his work, Memory Unearthed. Um, this is a kind of wacky uh, set of photographs of the little birthday boy. Here he is at the head of the table. 
Here he is pretending to be a ghetto policeman and <laughs> with his yellow star. Um, and what this reminds me of, or make, makes me think about, is that the Holocaust, I, I think to understand the period of the Holocaust comprehensively, we need to remember that people remained people. People still made jokes. People still had birthday parties if they could. Um, little kids were little kids. It wasn't all just the terrible stuff that happened that ended people's lives. These photos remind me of that. However, the horrible things happened too. This is a photograph. Now, by this time, Henrik Ross, with his little Leica camera, is sneaking it around. He has a pocket inside his big, heavy coat. And he walks, I'll try to show you. He walks around town like this with his coat covered. And when he has a moment, he whips out the camera and takes a picture and hides it again. So this is the kind of snapshot of events that he also took. Children being taken away, probably to Felmo, one of the extermination camps. People continued to feed themselves. There were gardens inside the ghetto in Woj. It was a very large ghetto. This is the ghetto that lasted for over three years. Here people are planting. I think this is from about 1941, so fairly early on. Um, here from 1943 are children digging in the ground for any potatoes they can find. By this time, famine is taking hold. Remarkable documents, these photographs. This is one of the moving days, like all the big urban ghettos. Uh, Jews were subjected to incredible overcrowding as people were brought in from other places uh, to be confined in the ghetto before they were either sent to labor or to Chemno or another extermination camp. And people were also sometimes forced to move arbitrarily or they would move to try to be with friends and family and so on. Um, this photo also reminds me of the weather. Uh, here's snow piled up along the side of the road as well as bricks and rubble from some destroyed buildings. And this is, this was the most daring photo that has survived, uh, although it was badly damaged. Um, these photos were uh, secreted and buried underground and then discovered, uh, found after the war. And Henry Cross and his wife both survived, by the way. Here, people are being sent to the train for deportation to an extermination camp. So this is an extremely risky moment to take a photograph of. And there's a Jewish policeman in the foreground um, guiding them on the way. And there was love. People got married, people had babies. He ends, uh, or the book ends with this dramatic photograph of part of one of the great synagogues of Woj that was destroyed. So having these sorts of documents to be able to reimagine or digitally rebuild places like the Woj Ghetto is a new forefront in Holocaust research um, that I think is going to produce a lot of really interesting work over the next decade or two. Now I'm going to Lithuania. I have just two little sections left in my talk. Um, this one is a roadside marker outside of Kovno or Kaunas, um, where if you don't know what's there, you drive right past it. It's just a two lane road in an industrial district. It looks like nothing, but on this site, 4,000 Jews were shot, uh, mostly young people and members of the intelligentsia. The little stones are left by tourists. So I, many of you may have heard of, sometimes it's called dark tourism or Holocaust tourism. There are tours organized for young Jewish people, and sometimes not just Jews, uh, anyone can be welcome, to go to various places. Often the you know, big groups, uh, the Israelis with draping the Israeli flags over their shoulders walk through Auschwitz. But here, kids have come and left the name of their relative in the place where they died. Um, so bus tours do occasionally pull up here, I was told. This is one of the, this is probably the most famous memorial site in Lithuania uh, at the Ponary Forest um, called in Lithuania Panerai. Uh, here, a very formal uh, and extremely important memorial. This is the biggest, this Ponary, uh, Ponary Forest altogether 
had more Jews killed than any place other than Babi Yar. Um, but here is another place, back in Kovno again, where 125 people were shot one day. It has a hauntingly familiar shape. Um, it was just sandy soil that was dug out into a pit and people were shot and buried. In the industrial district, this is not far from the other site I showed you a moment ago, um, and it's difficult to photograph. It's so featureless, and it just has that one stone um, here underneath a tree, one little stone marker. It's not marked on the road. I only knew about it because of this man, Richard Schofield, who was an Englishman who has made it his mission to try to educate Lithuanian school children about what happened in their country, because in the official curriculum of Lithuania, the Holocaust is not mentioned. Lastly, the tiny places, the moments really, this is, this is where time and place come together in the Stoppelsteine, which I expect many of you know about. This, was, this is an ongoing art installation project uh, by the, I believe he's a German artist, Gunther Demnig, who came up with the amazing idea of memorializing individuals at their last known residence before they were taken away to a ghetto or a camp or um, shot in the street or whatever. So this is the basic form. It's extremely simple. Here is the artist. Each bronze um, stamped little uh, plaque, little teeny plaque, is set into concrete, which is then set into the street or sometimes into a wall. Here he is at work. He insists on doing this himself. I've heard occasionally he's hired assistants, but he really wants to do as many as he can himself. So they're done just right. And these last three pictures were taken by my sister, Mary Barber, who went with our other sister, Martha Graham, to Rome. And they had a lovely vacation in Rome. And along the way, they stumbled over, which is what you're supposed to do. Stoppelsteiner means stumbling stones. They stumbled over these memorials and took pictures for me, the Holocaust sister. <laughs> so here's one little grouping of people. And here's another close up. Here lived Constanza Sonino, born 1909, arrested, deported to Auschwitz, died um, in an unknown place at an unknown time. And here's my sister Martha looking at that stumbling stone outside a nice little apartment building in Rome. Um, so what these what these pieces all mean, I think, is there's so much still to learn. There are so many places and so many people still to document, to understand, to think about. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about with you today. And I'm very eager to hear what you think. I welcome any and all suggestions for what we might do next. Thank you. Thank you, and so much. I'm absolutely fascinated. This is a way of looking at the Holocaust that I think is probably new um, to many of us. Um, I would like to open things up if someone has a question. Um, by all means, uh, you know, drop it right into the chat, or if there's just something you'd like, you'd like Professor Knowles to talk about in a little more depth. Um, and actually, there are. You know, I think if if you prefer to just use the raise hand feature, I it will move you to the top of the the queue. You know, on on our screens, and so we'll see it. Um, so please, anybody, if there's something you'd like to ask or comment on, um, I see already love this perspective. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Anybody else or just, just kind of wave at me or unmute yourself and jump in, I think there, if you'd like. For a small enough group, we can probably just chat. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And I see, how, how was your presence viewed by the local population? Um, you know, mm -hmm. did, they, did they know what you were studying, you know, as your, 
as you were doing this work? That's a good, good question. Yeah, um, that raises a number of thoughts. Uh, the only, this is a little embarrassing for a geographer to admit, the only field work I have done so far in Europe was in Lithuania and Latvia uh, in 2017. Uh, that's not true. I undersell myself. I've been to Poland twice. I've been to Krakow and I'm studying Krakow as well. Uh, I am desperate to get to Ukraine, to get to Bucic, to get to Belarus. Um, so if I had been to more such places, um, I would have a better answer. In Lithuania, I was traveling with two experts who were taking me so far off the main roads, like that site that I showed you with Richard Schofield, that there were no locals to respond. Um, they both told me, he and Milda Yakult Vasil, who is creating um, with money from an oligarch, and I don't know if that oligarch is gonna hang in for the duration, uh, Lithuania's first Holocaust museum in the countryside, the first museum of the shtetl. Uh, and they have experienced not any uh, protests, certainly no violence as far as I know, but also no interest. And what I've heard from other colleagues who have studied Belarus and Ukraine and, and parts further east in Russia is that the lack of present day memory and the hesitancy of most people to speak about the Holocaust, whether they witness it themselves or their ancestor or family did, is so deep that um, there's an enormous amount of denial in the East. In Germany, you might almost say the Holocaust is everywhere. Huge, you know, the, the Denkmal, the huge memorial to the Holocaust in the middle of Berlin, near the Reichstag, is a city block large, and it is filled all day, every day with tourists. So it's a very different attitude in Germany, where the Holocaust is a mandatory part of the curriculum multiple times. So much so that I've heard German school kids say, oh, no, not the Holocaust again. <laughs> um, and two, two new population. Is it possible to get copies of the maps that you shared? And is there currently oh. still much of a Jewish population um, in these areas? I can put I can put into the chat um, a book that my research group published, which has a number of the maps that I showed you. Um, it's called Geographies of the Holocaust by Indiana University Press, 2014. Um, and that book has uh, a whole chapter on concentration camps, and it has a chapter that's half on um, Belarus and half on Lithuania. Um, other maps in the presentation um, actually have too many error, errors, like those first little dotty maps. I just showed them to give an impression, um, so I'd rather not share it. However, my group working on the Holocaust ghettos right now is preparing a whole bunch of publications. So I'd be happy to keep in touch with Erica and Tam and share with your community when things become available, which we hope will include, though it may be two years out, a public website where people can make their own maps and ask their own questions to use in teaching and research, genealogy, uh, programming. And so I'll be very happy to keep you informed about that as well. Um, is there much of a Jewish population? In Lithuania, it's tiny. Um, it's it's less than ten thousand, and it may be closer to four, three or four thousand people by now. Um, some the Polish population in Poland has been rebounding some, but I can't give you a definite number. Um, and I also don't know about Ukraine. Um, across Ukraine, in its various territories at the time of the war, there was enormous devastation, and most Jews were killed. As in Buchach, only about 12 people survived out of 8,000. Um, so I bet there's not much there at all. Many people, of course, fled to uh, Israel if they could, or if they survived the war, to um, 
DP camps, and then many of those people ended up in the US, Canada, and Australia. So that, that whole one of the maps I hope to make in the future will represent the depopulation of Jewish America. Are there any other questions? And again, we, we have Professor Knowles for a little bit longer, if um, anyone would like to keep picking her brain. Um, I have a question or something that per perhaps people might be interested in, since you, you talked a little bit about how, I mean, certainly in Germany, they have acknowledged the Holocaust, you know, it is, you know, memorialized everywhere. And in Eastern Europe, there's been, I would say, almost an effort to to distance themselves from the Holocaust or to not acknowledge it and really almost to hide it. Um, and so I'm just curious, you know, why you think that, you know, or if, you know, if you've thought about why that might be, why, why the very, very different approaches between the West and the East? Well, Germany was the first country whose war crimes were exposed to the world. Uh, very publicly through televised trials. The, tele the televising of the Eichmann trial, for example, in Jerusalem had a huge impact on world awareness and world opinion. That trial was also, I think it was the first where, or was it an earlier one? I'm sorry, I'm not a specialist in war trials, but one of the early ones was the first time that survivors, Jewish survivors, were allowed to testify. There had been an attitude by judges and lawyers that um, emotional people couldn't be trusted to give true testimony. And it took um, particularly American lawyers arguing that their testimony was vital to achieve convictions that they were allowed. Um, so being so publicly confronted with war crimes was part of what happened in Germany. In the Soviet bloc, there are hundreds, probably thousands of memorials to Soviet civilians, the Soviet people who suffered under the Nazis. So Putin, now talking about Nazis in Ukraine, goes back to the old uh, sort of party line, which in 1945 was terribly true, that the Nazis had ruined, had crushed, had destroyed Soviet life. Soviet lives. So the memorials are to the innocent Soviet civilians killed by the Nazis. And now Putin is trying to pick up that line by saying there are still Nazis and we still have to be afraid of them and we have to denazify Ukraine. Um, many of the memorials to so Soviet innocents are actually memorials to Soviet Jews. But they weren't marked that way because, for political reasons, under the Soviet regime. Any organization trying to undo the demonizing of the Jews, um, I think there are many. The Anti Defamation League in this country is active internationally to try to identify and stamp out defamation, um, demon, demonizing. Um, there are uh, I think organizations, I certainly met people very active in Lithuania trying to fight persistent anti-Semitism. Uh, there are people fighting anti-Semitism in Poland today and in Russia today. Um, it's very distressing to see that rise up again as part of today's identity politics. Um, it shouldn't be happening. Thank you so much. I don't, I don't see any any more questions coming in. Um, Thank you for so coming. I, it, go have your yeah. supper. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so so much. This was this was wonderfully interesting, and I think has given Thank us you. all a, a unique perspective and a view of the Holocaust that that many of us have not had before. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Very, You're very, very welcome. Much. Thank you, everybody. Take care of yourselves. Today. And everybody, please have a great evening. Thank you, everyone.